Hello and welcome to Tech Circle. We are in conversation with Manan Khurma, founder and CEO of EdTech startup QMath. Thank you, Manan, for taking the time out and joining us today. Thank you, Shweta, and it's great to be chatting with you. Same, yeah. Uh, so, Manan, let's begin with an overview of company's performance last year. So, right. uh, just wanted to ask, was it really in sync with the tailwind that the EdTech sector witnessed uh, due to the yeah. pandemic? Yeah, yeah. So, I think QMath as a company did really well in 2020. Um, you know, despite the bad macro situation around COVID and all, I think at tech in general and QMath in particular, you know, we've done really well through the year. Um, we scaled to more than three times of our previous year, previous fiscal year's revenues. And we also went international. So today we are present in more than a dozen countries across the world. So we have this live class platform that enables our teacher network to teach math and coding to kids across India and across the world. Uh, so we have scaled quite aggressively outside India as well. And we also managed to raise uh, a new round of capital, about $40 million from new investors. And uh, in, during the year, we also doubled our teacher network uh, to now more than 10,000 teachers. And our student base will hit 100,000 students soon. So, so yeah, so we did very well. Um, we grew 3x over the previous year and we should grow 3x again over this year. Okay, so this user yeah. traction you're talking about, how different uh, would you say this is from the other players who, you know, cater to all the subjects? Because this is specific to maths, right? Yeah, yeah. So we do math and coding, Shweta, um, but we do it across the world. So we are a platform for math and coding, but we have a global presence. We're not just building for India and we're not just based in India. So mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of our revenue and a lot of our students are actually coming from outside the country and not just within. So in that sense, our um, target market um, is huge, you know, because it's across the world and all English speaking countries um, are our market to begin with. So for example, we have a strong presence in the US where we have, uh, you know, a large number of students, uh, Canada, Australia, Singapore. Um, we have a very uh, good upcoming presence in the UAE as well. So, so while yes, we are focused on a specific set of skills, which is math and coding, but our addressable market is across the globe. Yes. So this is specific to K-12, right? So this is K-12, um, um, which is uh, after school classes for math and coding for K-12 students. Um, and uh, these are not like supplementary classes. So for example, if a grade four kid joins QMath for, for our math classes, then they will cover everything in QMath that they also, that they do in school. So all the normal curriculum that they have in school, like, you know, fractions, decimals and so on, they will cover in QMath as well. So this is not a supplementary class. This is actually a core math class uh, and similarly for coding. Yeah. Yeah. So this is specific to K-12. Yeah. yeah specific to K-12. And this is how, uh, uh, this is since the inception or this, this K-12 uh, is something that you started uh, some time back? No, we started. Started with K to eight, kindergarten to eight. Okay. Uh, last year we expanded it to K to ten, and this year we have expanded it to twelve, all the way up to grade twelve. So mm -hmm. we cover all the thirteen years of school from kindergarten to grade twelve. Okay, so so uh, yeah. were there any changes in the strategy or anything of that sort that you guys did because last year saw a lot of traction and momentum? So was there any right. uh, not exactly pivot, but any any change in strategy with with respect to content or uh, right. lectures, etc. Right. So before COVID, we did have a significant part of our revenue coming from our offline classes as well. So our teachers before COVID were doing both online as well as offline classes. Um, but since uh, post COVID, uh, we have basically moved exclusively to online classes. Um, and that's actually worked out well for us because, uh, you know, as I said earlier, we have seen huge growth over the last year. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't call it a pivot. Uh, I think it's the exact same uh, model. It's the exact same pedagogy and curriculum and so on. But yes, one major change that has happened is from a hybrid offline online company before COVID, we have moved to a completely online company and we have gone international. So that's uh, before COVID, we had a very um, small international presence, all organic. But since then, we've grown pretty aggressively outside the country as well. Okay, so this expansion you're talking about is, is uh, something uh, which is happening lately? Yeah, it started in uh, when COVID started, which is around March of last year. And uh, from a, from an essentially negligible student base outside the country, we have a huge student base now outside the country. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, last year brought many challenges with it. So uh, are there any particular ones, the prominent ones that you would like to highlight? I think, I think uh, overall, 
you know, edtech is one of the very few sectors that has benefited immensely from uh, COVID because, you know, consumer behavior generally change over, uh, changes over a very long period of time. But uh, because of COVID, a lot of things were forced. And uh, for example, parents' acceptance of the online uh, mode of learning has uh, pretty much gone up dramatically overnight. So something that would have taken a decade earlier happened in the course of a year. So COVID has definitely reset that consumer behavior to some extent. Obviously, there'll be some reversion back to, you know, offline classes and offline ways of learning, but right. the acceptance for online has uh, become much higher. Um, and India itself has a very deep uh, education market, quarter of a billion students just in India alone. But in our case, the market is actually global and you have a billion students across the world who want to learn math and coding, right? So the opportunity is huge. Uh, I think I think now the challenge for edtech players like us and for everyone else is there are twofold uh, challenges. One is how do you scale uh, without burning insane amounts of money? You know, how do you scale at reasonable uh, cost? You know, how do you not like overspend on, let's say, marketing and branding and so on and, uh, and, and, and still manage to scale well, right? That's one challenge on which I think we, we are doing very well. I think the second challenge is how do you create outcomes at scale? So yes, you can scale to hundreds of thousands and millions of students, but can you ensure that every student is learning and benefiting from the program that they're joining? Um, and I think ultimately the few players who will win this market and who will stand out in this market will be players who uh, really engineer outcomes at scale. So that is something that we are working very aggressively towards. Yeah. Right. But yeah, it take, um, is a great opportunity at this point in time. Yes. And uh, do you see this momentum uh, Manan, continuing this year or in the years to come or do you think it will subsequently diminish? No, no, for sure. The momentum will only grow now uh, going forward. EdTech is now finally come of age, you know, from a nascent industry before COVID. Um, now I think it's going to find dramatic growth um, and not just in core segments, but also in a lot of other segments, you know, like skilling for children, for example, not just uh, the subjects that they have to do in school, like math and English and so on, but additional skills like, you know, like coding, for example, has uh, grown quite a lot and um, communication skills and things like that will also grow. So I think EdTech as a whole will grow quite dram dramatically and this momentum will definitely continue for the next few years. It will only grow. Yeah, that's, that's what I feel. Yeah. And you spoke of expansion. Uh, and apart from that, are there any other strategies and plans uh, that QMath has for, say, coming 12 months? Yeah, so we are investing heavily in our product. Um, so our product is a live class platform that enables our teachers to teach math and coding to kids um, in India and across the world. And uh, we are in making a lot of investments on the product to make sure that every class is very engaging and every class uh, creates like strong learning outcomes for the student and quality is monitored. We are building some AI tools as well to make sure that automatic monitoring of quality is happening, you know, in terms of how the teacher is teaching and so on. So, so one uh, area of effort is just making sure the product is like really strong. Another area of effort is brand building. So we, we are planning a lot of campaigns this year in India as well as outside that will help us build QMath as the foremost math learning brand in the world. Um, so, so that is another area of investment that we're going to look at. Yeah. And uh, you guys raised some funding in someone's back. So uh, is, is everything deployed as per plan? Yeah, I mean, um, we raised a large round. It was 40 million. So we still have most of it uh, with us. And uh, it will be uh, spent over the next 18 to 24 months. But we also have, we are also generating a lot of revenue. So our revenue scale is very good. Um, so I think as of today, the financial situation is very, very healthy. Yes. And the one thing I wanted to ask is about the trainers on platform, the teachers, the trainers, right. how much that went up to, you know, cater to the demand, uh, the, the sudden traction that the platform would have also been witnessing at that time. So Correct. Correct. how did you guys manage so, that? Yeah. yeah. So we started uh, when, before COVID, we had a little less than 5,000 trainers on the platform. Um, that's already more than doubled uh, over the last year through COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, but because we are seeing this huge growth in demand, that number will only go up and uh, over the next year, you know, this number will again increase by 50 to hundred percent. So, but our trainer selection process is very stringent. You know, we select only 3% of applicants who apply to become QMAT teachers. Uh, so we do source a lot of candidates from all over the country and all of our trainers are based in India. So we do source uh, candidates from all over the country, but then we put them through a rigorous uh, selection and training process. And even after that, you know, we'll upskill them and monitor them and so on. But yes, we've grown the network quite a bit. 
and also uh, interestingly um, many of our trainers are now making full time incomes on the platform you know because they're teaching not just in india but outside india as well so some of our teachers will teach in evening hours in india and then in morning hours in other countries and uh, it combined you know they are, they they become they become the primary uh, earners in their family so that's been a great success of this uh, whole phase